Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe P. Zapia. And today, we're taking a look back at the quarterback position, the takeaways, and the expectations for 2023. And to help me do it, of course, we have a great guest here. Andrew Seifter is back from our own Fantasy Pros family. And Derek Brown, fresh with a full belly of butter beer from <laughs> Universal, from Disney. Again, it's a it's a trip when you have as many kids as Derek has. It's not a vacation. So we'll see if we get him a vacation at some point this year. But D-Bro, Andrew, it's great to see both of you here on the show today. And of course, we always like to take a look back so we can learn from things, where we went right, where we went wrong, and also try to apply some of that knowledge to 2023 in terms of our rankings and our expectations and our approach. And this is a good thing. This is how we evolve. This is how we get better plans for better fantasy football seasons. That's what we want to do. Now, before we get into the fantasy, don't forget, Betting Pros is crushing it. If you haven't already... Go to bettingpros.com slash podcast. Subscribe wherever you get your pods because the Betting Pros podcast is on fire right now. All the analysis, the insight, everything, it's free. Go check it out. If you listened to last week's show there, I won you a ton of money telling you to take the Cincinnati Bengals on the money line, telling you to take the Jamar Chase anytime touchdown score. If you just did that, it was a great Sunday for you. So don't miss out on money. Don't miss out on opportunities. We only have a few weeks left of football and the NFL Conference Championships are right around the corner. So we're going to have shows for all that. Again, bettingpros.com slash podcast. And wherever you get your pods, it's there. Go check it out. Subscribe today. And don't forget about the YouTube channel too. Very good. Betting pros. You can see my beautiful face there as well all the time. Just study. By the way, Derek Brown, how much did you miss my face? Oh, I missed you, Joey P. I mean, I was texting you pictures, throwing things yes. in Slack about all the butterbeer I was consuming <laughs> while I was in Harry Potter world. So, uh-huh. um, you know, turn about is fair play, my friend. You did the same thing I to mean, me I when did. you were in Harry Potter world. I so I had for my homie who wasn't there. I did. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I had to return Here's the question. favor. Are you a frozen butterbeer guy or are you just the straight Ooh. butterbeer guy? Like, that's the question. Mm, dude, it. All right, so I'm going to give you a two-parter here, okay? Oh, jeez. <laughs> why, Andrew, why is nothing easy with you? You walked into this one, Joe. I, I, I mean, did. come on, there needs I mean, to be. All right, it's only fine. like a 40-minute show today. What do we got? We need context, Joe. All right, always context it up, context. and then let's go. Okay. Frozen is a must whenever it's hot outside, and we're basically mm-hmm. in the summer and spring months, which we are not. So, considering Disney was 30 to 60, maybe 70 degrees while I was there, I went unfrozen. There you go. Okay, so I believe you do the frozen during the day and then the unfrozen at night. I think that's the that's the way to go. Uh, Andrew, at Disney, you got to do frozen, right? I mean, well, Disney. Disney, you don't get any of that fun. All you do is try to sit on an app and try to plan out the entire day. And it costs you every I think they charge you like 50 bucks every time you open the app. It's something like that. Just, hey, would you like to open the Disney app? Well, that'll cost you another 50 dollars. But I digress. Let's talk about the quarterbacks and see how much they're going to cost us uh, in terms of the takeaways. And uh, let's start with you, Andrew. You are our guest. Give me one of your takeaways from the 2022 season here when it regards to the quarterback position. All right. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me back on, guys. I I love doing these takeaway shows because, honestly, during the season, we're just looking one week at a time. We got we got our Mm -hmm. uh, nose buried in that in the stats and all that. And then you know, after the season, there's that week or two where you're either really frustrated or you're really happy. And uh, and then you take a deep breath and then you can look back a little bit and maybe you can learn something that will help you next season. Uh, so that's hopefully what we can do here today. Um, so my first takeaway is that the elite quarterbacks this season were just absolutely huge difference makers. And by the, the elite guys, I'm talking about Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. Uh, those three guys scored uh, 10 to 15 more fantasy points per game than Joe Burrow. They scored 25% more fantasy points per game than Lamar Jackson and Justin Fields and over 30% more fantasy points per game than the rest of the QB ones. Uh, now, as we know, things went a little bit haywire uh, for, for Hertz and Allen during the fantasy playoffs. Um, that's kind of a flukish one-off thing. But I think the big takeaway was, uh, you know, we've, we've had this movement towards super flex leagues to make quarterbacks more valuable. But honestly, even in a single QB league, quarterbacks really had a huge role to play in fantasy success. Like if you had one of those top three guys, uh, you likely dominated your competition during the fantasy regular season. Yeah. And I, and I think the old adage, the late round QB and all that stuff like this year, that was not great. I mean, if you were saying, oh, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Russell Wilson, these guys are fine. They're safe. It's it's not even so much of, of their disappointment, but it was more just how these rushing quarterbacks have really changed the dynamic of fantasy points here. 
in the last couple of years, whether it be Lamar, Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen, or even what we saw in Justin Fields this year too. Derek Brown, give me another takeaway from the quarterback position from 2022. Rushing, rushing, and oh, look at that. More rushing. <laughs> it all comes down to the rushing equity, guys. Like if you are not going to be a top rusher as at the quarterback position, chances are you getting into the top seven, top eight. The elite tier is really slim. When we look back last year, I mean, five of the seven top uh, quarterbacks in fantasy points per game also finished inside the top seven rushing yards per game. The only two outliers outside of that were Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes. How mm -hmm. did they compensate? Well, they just happened to finish oh, uh, second and fifth in passing touchdown rate and third and fifth in passing attempts. So it's either to get into that top seven and top eight for fantasy quarterbacks, you need to look at guys that either have rushing or or are going to, their offenses are going to push the pace and there's going to be a ton of volume. If those two boxes can't be checked, the likelihood of you getting into the top six, top seven quarterbacks in fantasy is mm, nil. Yeah, and, and I think the, the rushing quarterbacks will probably be valued slightly higher because a lot of you know smart folks like mm -hmm. us will be pushing that narrative and hopefully people will listen. But don't forget about what Derek's saying, which is some of these guys in these high volume offenses like Joe Burrow will come at a slight discount from these other quarterbacks. And that's also a pretty good return on investment in the draft. I also wonder too, you know, we're talking about Travis Kelsey, you know, last time and you know, where we would draft him and all these things. And, you know, you could take Kelsey with a top five pick, turn around, take an elite wide receiver and then take Patrick Mahomes to start the third round. I mean, that is really within the range of possibilities it's a heck of a start to a team potentially <laughs> do something mm -hmm. like that. Just saying, you know, people look at it and go, oh, yeah, that looks really good. But you kind of have to go early and often here uh, if in those first three rounds we're going to do something like that and be aggressive. All right, let's be aggressive here, Andrew. Give me another piece of the puzzle here from 2022 of quarterbacks that you've learned. Yeah, well, first I want to just stick with that point a little bit and uh, talk about the Konami code uh, to quote Rich Rebar because – that was an absolutely huge thing. And just to add a little to what Derek was saying, uh, for the top nine quarterbacks rushed for at least 700 yards and seven touchdowns. Um, but, you know, one thing I do want to say is there's the guys that are like the huge rushing guys. And then there's guys that are kind of the sneaky rushing guys. And they still uh, are really valuable, too. So, you know, we talk about Mahomes. We talk about a Justin Herbert guys like that, uh, they're not going to run for 700 yards, but they'll run for 300. Dak, you know, these guys can add this sneaky rushing value. So I feel like there's kind of that 300-yard threshold, which is like you want to at least get to there. You know, if, you, if you're if you a big uh, passing offense and you can also add 300 rushing yards, maybe like three, three to five touchdowns, like that's going to work. And to your point, Andrew, when you start looking at some of the guys last year who had that 300-ish rushing mark, you're looking at guys – uh, like Trevor Lawrence, who I think all of us are very excited about next year. Uh, you had guys like Geno Smith, who were very useful quarterbacks uh, in fantasy that kind of came out of nowhere. And then we've got some other guys who, well, I'll perform that as well. Uh, guys like Daniel Jones, who got up to the 700 level. That's more of the elite tier. But even some of those guys you're talking about, like Lawrence, Smith, useful in fantasy, possibly Trevor Lawrence could take that jump this year. Give me another takeaway, Andrew, for the quarterback position uh, from 2022. Yeah, so you touched on this one briefly as well, Joe, but I, it, there's a changing of the guard at the quarterback position this year. It was a bad year to bet on aging stars. Uh, you know, if you waited on QB, uh, there's a good chance that you settled for one of the previous stars at the position, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Matthew Stafford. And if you did, if you did that, it had disastrous consequences this year. Uh, Brady and Rodgers struggled to get on the same page with their receivers. Wilson rarely uh, showed any sign of the magic that he – routinely displayed in Seattle and Stafford was just running for his life from day one uh, before eventually getting hurt. And, uh, you know, it may have felt all right at the time to wait on QB and get a big name guy like that, but it ended up being the kind of move that could absolutely ruin your season. Yeah, it's a great point. too. It's so weird too, because the Brady one I think was more surprising. I think the Rogers one, we all thought, well, lots of rookie wide receivers. It might not work out as well. Brady is like, Hey, these are the same guys you've been throwing to for the last three years. It all just fell apart. So bizarre, too. 733 pass attempts for Tom Brady. And year over year, he lost more than 600 passing yards. Basically the same amount of attempts, too. It's crazy. Both over 700. Uh, Debro, give me another takeaway from 2022. What do you got? I mean, it comes down to, like, uh, Andrew was talking about the changing of the guard. If you're going to wait on quarterback, and I'm not going to say that late-round quarterback is totally dead, 
But I think we need to change the way that we're viewing or the quarterbacks that we're going after at that point in the draft. And basically, if you're going to wait on quarterback, you need to look for a young quarterback that can be a part of an ascending offense. Or again, you need to go back to the well and go back to rushing. Because you look at these quarterbacks, there are quarterbacks that finished inside the top 12 in fantasy points per game that were drafted in the 10th round or later per FFPC ADP and best ball walking into the year. You have Justin Fields, QB5. He was drafted in the 11th round. Okay, there's the rushing. Dimes, Daniel Jones, QB9. Again, drafted in the 13th round. Okay, we're talking about rushing again. And here we get to the ascension part. Everybody wanted to crap all over Tua Tonga Bailoa walking into the year. He can't throw deep. He's blah. He's this. He's that. He's bad. He's, he's terrible. Okay, he wasn't bad. He was QB 10 in fantasy points per game. He was drafted in the 10th round. Then you look at Trevor Lawrence, QB 12, drafted in the 11th round. So to me, it's not that late round quarterback is dead, but we need to change the way that we are looking at and targeting those quarterbacks in later round. These old stalwarts like Andrew's talking about the changing of the guard. We need to go for young guys. We need to look for rushing, or we need to look at offensive situations that could possibly we're reading the room wrong. Like, we all talked crap and threw shade at Jacksonville in the offseason. That ended up being pretty bad as far as our takes go. So Mm -hmm. we need to look at these different situations, and that's where we need to go if we're looking at late-round guys. All right. uh, Fair enough here. Uh, Let's go back to you, Andrew. Give me one more piece of the puzzle for 2022 you're taking away. Yeah, so I think it's the systems. The system matters. Uh, dysfunctional schemes. We saw a lot of that this year, more than, you know, this is anecdotal, but I feel like we saw a lot more of that this season than we have in seasons past of just teams that just looked like it was, they didn't have preseason or something like they didn't, there was no chemistry that things just weren't lo- working. It's like what you were talking about, Joe, with Brady and Mike Evans. Like we saw that across the league uh, with a lot of teams and those teams did not produce the fantasy points uh, that we're looking for. So, you know, I think when you talk about Russell Wilson, There's some debate about how much of his struggles you can pin just on Nathaniel Hackett, but I think it's fair to say at least some of it. Uh, But then you look (laughs) at some other uh, dysfunctional offenses that took a toll even on the most talented quarterbacks in the game. You know, guys like Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, uh, all didn't quite meet their expectations because they were held back by offensive schemes that just didn't play to their strengths. And then, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Derek was talking about Justin Fields. I mean, his season was really a season of two halves, right? In the first half of the season, they did not run an offense that played to his strengths, and he wasn't a usable fantasy option. Then all of a sudden, around midseason, they said, we have one of the best running quarterbacks in the league. Let's start calling some designed runs for this guy. And then he was a a, an elite top three quarterback the rest of the season, you know? So uh, really, uh, it's, it's these coaches need to do their jobs. They need to look at the talent on their rosters and not – have take lock where they're like, this is my scheme. I've always run and I'm going to run it. The best coaches uh, adapt mm-hmm. to the talent on their team. And uh, we, that makes a huge difference for fantasy. Like we can say this guy's talent, more talented than this guy. You know, I still am not really that big on Tua, but you look at the system, beautiful system for, for him, put him in a position to be successful. And he ended up having a great fantasy season. So uh, I think that's something we really have to keep in mind. Those systems matter a, a big uh, deal. They do. And the right people to run those systems. So you're 100% right. And the better coaches that have lasted in the NFL, whether it be Belichick, whether it be Tomlin, whether it be whoever those guys are, Andy Reid, they cater systems. You know, Andy Reid won with Alex Smith before he won with Patrick Mahomes. And before that, he won with Donovan McNabb. And well, before that, he was hanging out somewhere at the at the buffet. Uh, let's get uh, one more. Uh, actually, I think that's all the takeaways, right? I believe. Uh, Derek Brown, anything else you want to add maybe potentially to – uh, what we were talking about. What about new schemes too? As we look at so many new head coaches coming in, is that also something to be a little leery of considering how I don't want to pile on Denver, but it's fun. Let's pile on Denver here. All those new things did not gel together with so many quarterbacks potentially moving to new spots with so many new coaches. Is that something to be leery of in 2023? I think we need to take that situation by situation. And I think some of the things that we were looking for takeaways and we're all so high on Denver and then we saw the bus potential and the horrible season that Russell Wilson had, some of this we need to look at different situations. Is Are we adding a quarterback to an entirely different offensive personnel? Or are we just adding a coach into the mix and the quarterback already has rapport 
with said running backs, offensive system, like every situation is going to be a little bit different. So like, depending on who lands in Arizona, I'm probably still going to be high on Kyler because regardless of whatever happens to DeAndre Hopkins, we know Kyler's going to run. He still has Marquise Brown. He still has Zach Ertz. There's going to be continuity and familiarity with those guys and pass catchers. So I think we need to take some of the offseason moves with and put them in their own different buckets. Like this quarterback's getting transplanted to an entire different offense. He has to learn and build rapport with, like say Aaron Rodgers moves this offseason. Okay, mm-hmm. well, Aaron Rodgers is not that big on spending a lot of quality time with his offensive personnel in the offseason. Okay, so is their rapport going to struggle out of the gate? Versus, okay, well, it's all the same skill guys in the same offense. We're just hit, we're, we're air dropping a coach in a different scheme into that system. And how's that going to look? So I think each one of these things, we're going to take it and put it in its own different little bucket for next season. All right. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, like, I, I think that's a good point on the rushing. I think it, the quarterbacks that have the rushing, that's another reason that's a huge appeal is because when things break down, they often do their best, you know, so mm-hmm. uh, they don't necessarily have the same. They don't need the same level of precision in their offense that the drop back passing quarterbacks do. Uh, so I think that's a that's a really strong point there. And then I would say just my approach would be. The guys I want to take at the top, if I'm spending an early round pick on a quarterback, I do want that continuity. I want to know exactly what I'm getting uh, with my quarterback. Um, but then I agree once you get past th- those guys, uh, then it becomes a case by case basis, like Derek said, where you, you look at each individual situation. Agreed. All right, let's get to the hits and misses. Uh, give me two guys, D bro, that you hit on in 2022. And I'm sure one of them is going to be the guy in Philadelphia. Well, I'll bury the lead then a little bit. I'll start with Tua Tagovailoa. Um, right, I was go. extremely high on him walking into the season, and all he did was ball out whenever he was healthy and on the field. QB10 talked about in fantasy points per game. He In his 11 games that he had 90% or higher snaps, the guy had four, uh, well, five games inside of the top four quarterbacks. He was third behind only Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen, with the number of games where he had at least 280 passing yards and three or more passing touchdowns. He was, I mean, he was awesome, regardless of whatever metric you look at. Fourth in PFF passing grade, first in deep ball ball completion rate, first in deep ball accuracy. So, look, if if two is going to come at a discount again next year, consider me buying in. I mean, the offensive scheme is going to be there. The offensive line, if they improve there, he's going to need more time in the pocket. I'm in for it. But the other guy, yeah, What about Joe? the concussion issues, though, before we even move on to the obvious one you're going to talk about? Because the concussion issues, I think, look, we saw it shorten Troy Aikman's career, and that was before mm-hmm. we knew what we knew and the way we handle these things. Does that – it's one thing in Dynasty to talk about to his long-term question mark, and I think that's extremely fair. Is it fair to even talk about 2023 in the redraft? I think it's fair, but – it, again, I think that he's not going to be a premium pick. So a lot of the risk that you're going to take on by drafting Tua, I think is going to be baked into his ADP. So considering that, yes, mm-hmm. if it's baked into his ADP, okay. then we're accounting for it. Then yes, I'm going to just dive in. That's fine. All right. Now you can talk about Jalen Hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, come on. I, I could have easily started this off with Jalen Hurts and then we would have gone on a rant and I would have been talking mm-hmm. for 30 minutes straight about Jalen Hurts. And that might still happen. <sighs> but... Jalen Hurts is that dude. I talked about it all, all, all offseason. I said Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown are the, are the league-winning combo that you need to be drafting. I said he is going to be in the contention for the MVP this year. Nobody wanted to hear it. Everybody called me crazy. <laughs> I still got comments all up in my DMs and in my tweets saying he's a running back. He can't throw. He's he's bad. Oh, we might see Gardner Minshew. Like, well, regardless, on, it man. doesn't matter. It's fantasy. Like... You know, you could be a, he you was be awesome. a mediocre matter. real life quarterback and a great fantasy quarterback. We've seen that. Except he was awesome from fantasy standpoint yeah. and real life, considering he was first in fantasy points per drop back. He was sixth in PFF passing grade. He was fourth in yards per attempt. He finished mm-hmm. top 12 in big throws and fifth in adjusted completion rate. So, For all the haters, and I know that you're still like, y'all are sitting under rocks. You're just trying to, you're trying to bide your time. And if Jalen Hurts doesn't make the Super Bowl or whatever happens in the playoffs, you're going to come out and the boo birds are going to be speaking again. Okay. Jalen Hurts is that dude. He's always been that dude. He's going to continue to be that dude. So again, I'm going to be drafting a ton of Jalen Hurts in 2023. Mm -hmm. I still can't believe that he supported two 
top 10 wide receivers in fantasy. That that to me was the biggest surprise. And look, I mean, again, nobody talked more about the Eagles and Derek <laughs> Brown for all of July and August. So you absolutely nailed that. Andrew, who did you nail in 2022, the quarterback position? Uh, who are the guys that were absolutely the hits for you? Well, I don't know if I was quite as high on Jalen Hurts as Debro, apparently, but I, I was also be, very so high on him. <laughs> <laughs> I had him ranked ahead of guys like Kyler, ahead of Joe Burrow, top five uh, quarterback coming in the season. And for me, it was just about knowing that he had that job security. That was really the only thing, because I was a little down on him in 2021. And the reason was I was just worried if he struggled in real life, he could then you could see Gardner Minshew. But after what he did in 2021, there was zero chance, as far as I was concerned, he was going to lose snaps to Gardner Minshew <laughs> uh, this last season. So we already knew that when Jalen Hurts plays, because of the rushing ability, he is a fantasy superstar, even if he didn't take any steps forward as a passer. But again, there was every reason to believe he would take steps forward as a passer, both just because he had more experience in the league and because A.J. Brown was coming to town. So uh, he had uh, you know elite weapons coming into the season, uh, a good scheme and that rushing floor. So uh, I, to me, it was like a very safe bet uh, to go with a Jalen Hurts, like right there with a Lamar Jackson. And he ended up being a lot better than Lamar Jackson uh, in the end. So uh, he was one guy I was definitely buying into as well. Uh, the other, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper here and go with Geno Smith, because I, I was looking at my rankings and who I was above uh, the expert consensus on in my draft rankings. And I was quite a bit ahead of consensus on Geno. Um, so I was trying to think back to why exactly that was. And I think, one thing was, I have no respect for Drew Locke. That's one thing. So I knew there was zero <laughs> chance that Gino Smith was not going to no win that job. That, yeah. mm -hmm. He was going to win that job. He was going to hold that job all season long. I thought it was another team where uh, you look mm. at the scheme. It's a, it's just a good scheme. You know, people like to, uh, you know, crap on, uh, on uh, Pete Carroll for running a, a conservative offense and things like that. But I mean, Russell Wilson had great numbers uh, in that offense. And uh, there's great receivers to throw the football to in uh, in Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. Uh, and then I just think Geno Smith brings um, he brings some of the same skill set to the table uh, that Russell Wilson had. So it was kind of like a natural sort of fill. And I don't think I'm not going to say I predicted he was going to be a top five quarterback. Definitely not. But I did see some potential for him to uh, hold the job all year and be a little bit better than people expected. All right. Those are look, the Geno Smith was certainly a guy who saved the bacon mm -hmm. for so many people in Superflex leagues. I mean, geez, <laughs> like, what, what a great return on investment he was. Superflex was rough this past year. Like if you won Superflex leagues, you did a good job. It wasn't luck. You did a really good job of managing and picking up guys and somehow drafting a team that was good enough to withstand what we saw at the quarterback position. So with the hits always come the misses. So we'll hold ourselves accountable. Andrew, when you start, kick things off. Who did you miss on in 2022? Well, we talked about him a little bit already. Russell Wilson. I mean, I, I'm not the. I'm far from the only person that got burned uh, buying into Russell Wilson, but I really. It was got a burned. collective fail from the fantasy football community at large, and yeah. I think I think I don't think it was lazy. I think we all just wanted to look at upside. We just wanted to. We saw it as such a positive thing. Get him out of Seattle. Look at the weapons. But meanwhile, he was leaving Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, and I don't think that was given enough respect to. And I think new isn't always better and new takes a long time sometimes to work. I think we forgot that and we better remember it next year. We better remember yeah. it because there's going to be well, so mm -hmm. much new in 2023. Yeah. And I think the other aspect is with Nathaniel Hackett. I mean, it became clear from the first or second week of the season, this guy had no clue what he was doing and that it was, he was not going to make changes to get this offense moving. Um, and I think that that's something we can learn from in the future that these guys that come from a, an elite offense, you have to, you have to ask yourself the question, are they the reason that that was an elite offense? And did they actually learn what makes an elite offense from that experience? <laughs> or did they just happen to be in the right place at the right time? And I think with Nathaniel Hackett, we can kind of say now he was just in the right place in the right time um, with green Bay. And uh, you know, with Russ, I, I, I think you look back at his time in Seattle and really the keys to his success were uh, kind of playing off script and, and just having amazing chemistry with his wide receivers. And those are things that are hard to translate to a new situation when you've got new receivers, a new scheme. Like I said, Hackett didn't really let Russell Wilson play off script very much. He was trying to uh, fit into a system that just didn't work. And they were doing they were just making the same mistakes over and over again, not adjusting. I think some of that falls on Russ. Some of that falls on Hackett. 
Um, and, 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 you know, I, I just don't think he ever, it takes time to develop the kind of mm-hmm. chemistry that he had, especially with Lockett. Um, you know, it takes time to do that. And I don't think he's quite there yet with Sutton and Judy. So I think that was a factor. And then just the pressure of the trade too. I mean, it was such a high price they paid uh, to get Russell Wilson. The expectations, not just from the fantasy community, but from everybody was so huge that, that Russell Wilson was going to come in here and be a superstar, be in, in these shootout games every single week. And I think you could kind of see that weight on Russ. I think he, I think he was really trying to meet those expectations so hard that he, that he fell flat on his face. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the second one. Besides Russell Wilson, who else do you have here? All right. Well, this one, <laughs> I was trying to be creative with this. I was very high on Jameis Winston coming into the season, and it just did not work out. Uh, I'm pretty pissed at uh, at Dennis Allen for not giving him more of a chance uh, this season. But, I mean, you know, you take the good and the bad with Jameis. And he had uh, some really great moments in those first three games. He had some really bad moments in those first three games. And I think Dennis Allen is a very conservative coach, and he just decided mm. – I don't want the guy with the huge upside that can also throw three picks in a game. I want the the bland Andy Dalton, you know, so that's what he went with. And I, I don't think it was the right decision. Uh, I think it hurt their team, uh, their team's potential, uh, basically capped that potential, doesn't mm-hmm. give them any sort of knowledge about what they're going to do going forward because Andy Dalton's obviously not a long-term solution. So maybe Jameis isn't either, but they could have at least found out, you know, um, so I talked myself into Michael Thomas that blew up. I talked myself into Jameis. Uh, it just it it was ugly, and I think the Saints are kind of a team that is still living in the ghost of Sean Payton and Drew Brees, and that you know trying to do the same things with without those guys, and it just is not happening. I got a hot take, maybe. Uh, I think Sean Payton and the New Orleans Saints should just get back together after a year off, and he should come back. And it. I think that Sean Payton can win this division next year quite easily, especially if Tom Brady moves on from Tampa. This is a very winnable division. You just need to let it trade up for that quarterback. Go get the bears on the phone. Go give him the next young quarterback. Let him go groom him. Cause if you're Sean Payton, do you really want to deal with Kyler Murray coming off the injury and Kyler Murray's tantrums? Do you really want to go to X spot or Y? Do you really want to Denver can't afford Sean Payton? They don't have any draft picks left. Like it's, it just makes me laugh. Like, I was going to trade him for a ham sandwich. I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> I'm Sean Payton and the Saints. I think you have a moment where you sit down at a table, you come back together and you figure it out. And Sean Payton gets a little rest a year off and then you come back. What do you think about that, D bro, Mr. Saints? That would make me elated. I would I just don't, absolutely I don't see, I don't see where Sean, like, unless the Cowboys decide they're done with Carolina. McCarthy. Carolina can happen. <sighs> I could see that it'd be yeah, a landing spot. They have a lot of draft game. picks. They have an owner that's willing to sit here and when, how open many draft up the wallet. Bro, that's not going to happen. They're not going to. They're not going to give their old coach in the division. It's not going to happen. You know that. I know that. I mean, look, I, I'm just throwing out possibles. You you poo poo the Denver landing spot. And the I'm Arizona just saying. I'm, like, I'm giving them possible. I'm just saying. At the end of the day, Sean Payton's triumphant return with. I would love that. a high draft pick for a quarterback, I think is the way to go. For and then I can hype up Michael Thomas again. There you go. And we could all be <laughs> wrong about him for a third straight year. All right, D bro. Give me your QB misses for 2022. Well, Andrew already talked about Russ. I don't think we need to uh, sit here and pander on anymore about Russell Wilson. <laughs> he was bad. He was still going to be bad. I will say just to put the, uh, the tie, the bow on Russell Wilson for 2022 is that, I'm not going to say that I'm buying in for next year, but I am no. saying that there is a glimmer oh, no. of hope. No, hold on, hold on. There's a glimmer of mm-hmm. hope for Broncos fans out there because over the last four weeks with, you know, Hackett being gone, things like that. Russell Wilson over the last four games of this season was a top five QB in three out of those last four games. So just a small glimmer of hope. Although I will on the giant L that was Russell Wilson, the attached court Sutton loved. I mean, it's it's yeah, all he was QB bad. ten going into the year, and he finishes QB seventeen. So that's a pretty yeah, substantial he was, he was fall bad. off. He was bad. Um, and the other guy that we had to talk about, and you mentioned him earlier in the show, Joe, is Tampa Tom Brady. Tom Brady was terrible, and I think that we could also learn from this moment in the sense of like it, we talked about takeaways earlier in the show. Sometimes if we see four to five weeks of an offense just looking like there's there's a piece missing, something's off, everything, and we're like, okay, they got to get right, right? They they, they got to right the ship. Well, Russell Wilson didn't happen all year. Tom Brady didn't happen all year. Aaron Rodgers didn't happen all year. So maybe the other takeaway for this year and attaching this to Tom Brady was that 
we should have hopped off the boat before. I mean, it was time where, okay, your, your, your fantasy team was sunk. You're eight weeks into the season. We're all saying, okay, well, they're going to turn it around, right? Didn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Here's what's so fascinating like, about Brady is 719 attempts in 2021, 67 and a half completion percentage, right? Yep. 5,316 yards with 43 touchdowns and 12 picks. This year, 733 attempts. I remember he didn't really play the last game either, so we could really compare it properly. 66.8 completion percentage was right around the same spot. 4,600 yards passing, 25 touchdowns. So the touchdowns got cut in half. And look, it wasn't even a lot of picks. 12 picks last year, two years ago, last year, nine picks. So it was just the, the conversion rate was just horrendous. Like everything just kind yeah. of fell apart in the offense completely. And look, Byron left, which is also gone completely. They did so nothing like he did nothing with the volume, Joe. Like he was no. absolutely terribly inefficient. We're looking at Brady was 30th, 30th in fantasy points per drop back. Basically, the one egregious thing, and I and this is why I think that you could sit here and point to some of the Byron left, which stuff and, and him being ousted was that they neutered Chris Godwin into like this. Debo Samuel, like three to four yard A dot type of role. And it's like, what the heck are we doing here? You're not going to use Chris Godwin from the slot down the field. You're not going to put him on the outside. You're not going to let the guy stretch the field at all. It was basically the same terrible, boring offense every single week. We have a bad offensive line. We're going to run Lenny up the gut 20 times a game. Chris Godwin's going to run his short little crossers and do nothing with them. And Mike Evans is going to run go routes every single freaking snap. And Tom Brady's either going to airmail him or throw it on his back shoulder and he's never going to catch him. It's like you have to learn and pivot at some point, Byron, right? I feel like there's got to be some story to this Brady Mike Evans thing. It's like it just seems like there has to be something else there. Like, did they have some sort of like, you know, disagreement at a kid's birthday party or something? Like, what happened? Because <laughs> like know. they just they all season. I, I'm the kind of guy I usually like to bet on volume. You know what I mean? Like, if there's enough volume, well, you eventually that. it's going to pay no, off, right? Yeah. And it just never paid off with Mike Evans and Tom Brady. And I, I will also say, Joe, all those stats you were citing off. If I was Rob Gronkowski's agent, I would be mentioning those everywhere. Bring bring this guy back. He was the key. Like they, <laughs> Rob was, Gronkowski well, was the key to that. He offer. was because because he and Gronk have that relationship where you just know where each other's going to be because of all the reps they have and the trust they have. But it seems like the trust factor fell apart. You're right for Evans and Brady together, and just they were not on the same page. All even in the playoffs, we saw it. You know, the one time we saw it was Week 17 where nobody wanted to start him in the freaking fantasy championship of all places. I, I just you know which has got to be frustrating. Uh, so let's I, leave those frustrations in the past. I like let's Andrew's b- birthday narrative there. Because if we hark it back it's to draft season. Chuck E. Cheese, rough time. Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown got the Mickey Mouse birthday right, okay? So mm-hmm. maybe Tom Brady maybe. and Mike Evans should have taken maybe. a page out of that book. Just saying. It's possible. Saying. Birthdays are very important. Maybe he didn't send a card. All right, let's get to the bold predictions for 2023. We're going to lightning round through these, give everybody quick predictions. Uh, Debra, why don't you kick us off with your number uh, four prediction here. We'll go. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want to do like countdown style. Yeah, let's go. Whatever your style. hottest take is, whatever that might be, the boldest of the bold. Maybe we'll save that for one. So give me one yeah. here off the bat that you like. So I think Minnesota Vikings add a first round wide receiver to the mix in this year's draft. And that makes Kirk Cousins a top three fantasy quarterback for next year. All the things are there. All we need is better receiving weapons. He was mm-hmm. fourth in passing attempts, second in red zone passing attempts. The guy was at third in red zone passing rate. So if you add somebody to the mix that's going to sit here and throw maybe Adam Thielen into the slot, give him a field stretcher, and now we got Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson, Kirk Cousin, man van, top three quarterback season. It's on the way, baby. All right. That's very exciting, potentially. <laughs> let's let's hope that that goes well. Someone asked me, could you win a, a Super Bowl with Kirk Cousins? And I said, yeah, you just got to give him a defense and stop asking him to come back from 30 points every week. I think and no primetime games. <laughs> and no, yeah, zero primetime games. Everything's in the afternoon. And uh, yeah, that'll do. All right, Andrew, give me one of your bowl predictions for 23 at the QB. All right. Well, I didn't organize them by hot takiness, but I'll we'll start just save with the, the one best that one I, I know last. that. Let's Zebra... just do that. Not even hot, because I don't like hot takes. I like bold good predictions here that you've quantified for a reason. That's what all right. Well, I'm going to start with the one I know Debra will disagree with, and that's the good, Tua Tag of Iloa is the new Jimmy Garoppolo. Oh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of comparisons wow. that you can draw 
between the Dolphins and the 49ers. And I think a, a lot of the time those comparisons are about the running game um, because we know uh, that Mike McDaniel brought the, the uh, 49ers style running attack to Miami. But I also think there's a lot you can say about the passing game because look at the San Francisco 49ers. Look at what Jimmy Garoppolo was able to do in that offense. Look what Brock Purdy is doing in that offense now. And I think it's the same exact situation with Tua Tagovailoa. He is in a phenomenal situation to be successful. Um, and he will be successful again next season for that reason. I'm not so worried about the concussions, but what I do think might happen is that the narrative will continue to build that as good as he as he's playing, uh, as well as he's playing, they can do better <laughs> and they're going to be he's going to have to be looking over his shoulder i think at next season i think that's going to be a narrative that starts to emerge especially if this dolphins team doesn't take a step forward in terms of wins and losses the expectations are going to be high after a playoff season so uh, i feel like uh, tua is going to put up qb1 numbers um, but it's going to come with that caveat of uh, is he the long-term solution and uh, is this a team that's going to go out and make that trey lance kind of a move uh, to find somebody that would be an upgrade over Tua. All right. I like that. I look, Tua, I think, is a very divisive player going to next year. D-Bro, give me another bold prediction for 2023. All right. Washington is going to hand the starting reins over to Sam Howell, and he is going to be the 2023 version of Daniel Jones. Hmm. Now, we talked about what, what, are the, uh, what are the parts of the recipe we need to make this happen. Okay, rushing. Well, Sam Howell, we know the rushing is there, 35 yards and his only start and a touchdown. And the ability to stretch the field, 8.9 yards per attempt. You got a strong cast of weapons around him in McLaurin, Samuel, and Dotson. All the things are there for him to explode and be the uh, 2023 version of Daniel Jones. I don't know. I watched a lot of Sam Howell in college, and I've never been impressed by it. I just don't get it. I don't get the Sam Howell fascination. I hope you're right for all those people who have him in Dynasty. We'll see what happens there. But look, it's not impossible. Then again, it's funny because I was on the pro Daniel Jones wagon coming out of college where everybody was bashing <laughs> the guy. So I don't know. Who knows? Maybe uh, maybe we're both right here. Let's get to uh, another one of your takes here, Andrew, for bold predictions for 23. All right. Well, so this is going to be probably the craziest offseason ever for quarterback movement yeah. uh, in the league. So I feel like I needed to devote one of these predictions uh, to some, some of those players and where they might end up. Uh, so here's my take on three of them. I think Tom Brady is going to go to the Las Vegas Raiders. He's going to reunite with Josh McDaniels. Uh, I just those two. It always seemed like Brady had a better relationship with McDaniel's than he did with with Belichick, to be honest. So I think that that's uh, th and, and they're both uh, coming off disappointing seasons uh, with l their seasons had left a bad taste in their mouth, McDaniel's and Brady. So they kind of need each other right now. Uh, I think they're going to uh, circle the tent together and go into win now mode in Vegas next season. Uh, Lamar Jackson, I, I I think he's kind of fed up with with the Ravens. He's fed up with Baltimore. He's fed up that they haven't given him, you know, just instantly said yes to his contract demands. He wants that Deshaun Watson style contract, and the uh, Ravens have not been willing to do that. So I think he's going to end up getting moved uh, to the Falcons, uh, which That's is my a, a team. one too. That's my landing spot for him. Yeah, so. I, it's just the similarities in the offensive scheme are there. It's a team that's. You know, a lot of teams, Lamar wouldn't fit. They'd have to change oh, the whole You drop offense. him into the Falcons. The Falcons, I think, become the favorite for that division. And I don't even yeah. think that's crazy. Yeah, Oof. so I think I think Lamar goes to the Falcons, and that opens up uh, the Ravens situation. And I think the Ravens trade for Trey Lance. Uh, I, I, like, mm -hmm. Brock Purdy seems like he's going to be the starter for San Francisco next year. That would be a good move for the Ravens, too, because it would save them a lot of cap space, too. You could still, in that first contract, spend some money elsewhere, and they need to. And they just spent a whole lot of money on Roquan Smith. Here's my only thing with the Brady one, Andrew. I can't see him leaving Florida. And 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 it's maybe Miami is the other landing spot, but there's no state income tax. Now that you're divorced, your kids don't live in the same house. It's not like you say, hey, everybody, let's all pick up and move to Las Vegas. At least if you're in the same state, you can still be around everybody. I don't know. To me, it's Tom Brady leaving Florida is just a tough sell. I know everybody wants to put him in Vegas there. Do, do you think any real life stuff prohibits that potential? Because I really feel like it does. Well, didn't he already kind of uh, make his uh, choice, though? I mean, he kind of. Well, it's one thing to make your choice about playing family. football and not. It's another thing to move 2000 miles away. 
I mean, your he's, he, you know, uh, I don't think money is an issue for Tom Brady. So the, I don't the, think money the, is the an income issue tax thing. I don't think really it might be matters. more of an issue now since the divorce. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what the circumstances of that might be. Yeah, but, I don't know. Uh, he's still got half the year. He can live anywhere he wants. And, uh, you know, I want he Tom can always Brady, hop on uh, If you want to have fun, if you're Tom Brady in your old age, you go play with Mike McDaniel. I know that's going to ruin uh, your Tua takes here, but uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, bro. That's true. I mean, what do you what do you think about Tom Brady the, wearing that Miami Dolphins helmet, getting to play Bill Belichick twice a year, and stick it to him? What do you think about that? That'd be interesting. It'd be, I mean, the, he's the entire <laughs> reason why Miami doesn't have a first round pick this year. So he is. You maybe might as well go get him anyway. How about the Jets. <laughs> the Jets. I I don't know. Nah, I just I, I don't see him going see to the play Jets. for the Jets. Like no, it's just no, that, that would be as an ex, be a as a Patriot story, fan, yeah. I could see him playing for the Dolphins again, Florida. I think it's the Jets end sense. up with Derek Carr. That's my guess. I still yeah. think Garoppolo is their guy, but we'll see. Oof. We'll see. It's going to be fun. All right, Gibro, give me another uh, bold prediction for 2023 QBs. Well, I already gave Daniel Jones a little bit of love in the form of Sam Howell. Now I'm going to go right back to the well. Daniel Jones is going to be a top five quarterback in fantasy Ooh, next year. For who? The New York Giants? <laughs> for the New York Giants. Okay. I just want I think it's going to happen. He was QB nine in fantasy points per game. We know the rushing is there. He had no touchdown luck through the air. And we're going to talk about days and everybody knows about the wide receiver situation. The Giants address the wide receiver situation in the draft this year. The offensive line plays better, whether they re-sign Saquon or they don't, how that looks. But I think Daniel Jones, you're looking at next year, he was 32nd in passing touchdown rate. If that comes up even to a median range, Mm. we're talking about a guy that was QB9 based off of his legs. He was super proficient and very good with like taking care of the football because he was first in just a completion rate. So now we're just add some more passing touchdowns and the guy can go from top 10 QB to top five. Yeah, I had a real wide receiver maybe there too. Uh, I'll tell you what, I mean, he should go to Green Bay and play the Vikings twice a year. That's that's where you got to go if you're Daniel Jones after this year. My goodness, is he good against the Vikings? All right, Andrew, give me another uh, bold prediction for 2023. What do you got? Okay, well, I think this one is a little more bold uh, here after last night's game than it would have been uh, last week. <laughs> but Jack I Prescott, like this one, by the way. Dak right. Prescott, top five fantasy QB next season. Uh, he, you know, his 2022 stats really didn't jump off the page, um, but he did throw 19 touchdowns in eight games from weeks 10 to 17. Uh, and then, of course, lit up the Bucks for four TDs in the wild card round mm-hmm. before uh, that disastrous performance against the 49ers last night. Um, so, but you know, big big picture. I mean, the guy basically missed the entire first half of the season uh, with a broken thumb, uh, and I think uh, those were pretty impressive numbers in the second half uh, overall. And uh, you know, he should have plenty of weapons next year. I mean, Michael Gallup was uh, you know hurt coming into the season, so we certainly didn't see his best. Um, Dalton Schultz, I think, will either be back or they'll bring in somebody else of a similar caliber. Um, Tony Pollard probably won't be back, so maybe they just need to throw even more. And and the the defense is great, but um, that's they're the kind of defense that can give up some big plays. And I also just think in the long run, it's hard to predict uh, which defenses are going to be good from year to year. So uh, I, I feel like they'll need Dak to uh, to step up his game. I know everyone loves to hate on Dak right now, um, but I think he's uh, and he's another one of these QBs with the sneaky rushing. You know, not seven hundred mm-hmm. yards. But 300 yards, a few touchdowns, uh, that really adds to the bottom line. So I think he'll he'll find his way into that top five. All right, D bro, let's go. The boldest prediction for 2023. What do you got? Justin Fields breaks fantasy football. <laughs> you look at weeks seven through 18, the guy was second in passing touchdown raid. He was 22nd in passing attempts. The volume comes up at all. This is a guy that over that stretch was averaging 25.4 fantasy points per game. Since 2015, guys, there's only been three quarterbacks that have averaged that or higher. You got 2018 Patrick Mahomes, 2019 Lamar Jackson, and 2022 Jalen Hurts. He took step forward as a passer, week 7 through 16, 10th in big-time throw rate, 8th in adjusted completion rate, and he was 13th in passer rating right behind Trevor Lawrence. So if we get this guy some weapons, the offensive line plays a, e, even better. We know the rushing is there. Justin Fields could be the low-cost version, and I'm not going to put him on and say he'll be this year's Jalen Hurts, but he's got the talent and the opportunity to do that. Oh, oh look, I mean, they just got to surround him with more talent. They have that first pick, so they could really cash that in and get some players, get some 
better personnel. I wish that Chase Claypool move was so bad. I don't know why they made that trade. It was such a terrible trade. Uh, and it will continue to be so. That's not a that's not a bold prediction. That's just as a Paul Heyman would say, that's not a prediction. That's a spoiler. Uh, so let's go to yours, Andrew. What do you got for us with the boldest prediction of 2023? Okay, so I don't know if this is the boldest prediction, uh, but I will say that I think Justin Herbert will be the overall QB1 in fantasy next season. Uh, like this year, it. he finished as the QB 15 in fantasy points per game. And it's hard. I mean, we talk about disappointments. That is arguably the biggest disappointment of all. Right? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, he is such Agreed. a talented player. He has such great weapons. Everyone thought Brandon Staley was a genius coming into the season. And coming out of the season, everyone thinks he's a moron. So that's that's how quickly <laughs> things change in the NFL. But uh, the one thing I can say is next season, uh, hopefully he has Keenan Allen and Mike Williams healthy for the full season. That's something that certainly was not the case this year. Uh, they, we don't know who the Chargers are going to bring in as their offensive coordinator, but I, I think it's pretty safe to say it's going to be somebody that is on the same page with Justin Herbert in a way that Joe Lombardi was not. I mean, they were just playing dink and dunk all you season long. protect him better, too. I mean, he, yeah. he sacked 37 times. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, not as I much just, as Justin Fields, by the way, who was 55 times. <laughs> <laughs> like Joe, so you really want to talk about, like, if you have that first pick, maybe if you're the Bears, maybe just take an offensive lineman. Just yeah. But go ahead, well, Andrew. You know, I think Brandon Staley, I think he's a smart coach. I think he's going to look he's going to dissect what the holes are on this team and what they need to fix. And they're going to they're going to build an offense with input from Justin Herbert that really plays to his strengths. They're going to get him. You know, he's going to get that that sneaky rushing value, too. But I think he's going to be airing the ball out next season and be the overall QB one. I think it's dangerous for them uh, to rely on Mike Williams and Keenan Allen going forward. I think Keenan Allen has hit his window. Agreed. And I think Mike Williams, where we finally have to just come to that moment where we say, hey, Mike Williams can't stay on the field, can't stay healthy for a full season. They need to do something else there, I think. I don't know what it is. should have drafted a wide receiver last year. They need to draft one this year. I'm sorry for all the Josh Palmer stands out there, but he's he's not that guy. He's not an alpha kind of guy. He is not that guy. He cannot carry a passing attack. And I just like we realized, Keenan Allen's older, and Mike Williams Mm -hmm. is just not going to happen. It's just frustrating, so we just have to move on. All right, listener mailbag, let's hit this real quick here. Obviously, you can join our Discord. It is free to join, fantasybros.com slash chat, where the conversation is always turn to fantasy football uh this one's from cam ferg 10 half ppr choose two to keep for next year swift pollard garrett wilson olave and stevenson d bro who are your two guys in half ppr you're keeping in this group i'm going with chris olave who looked like a budding alpha this year i don't mm-hmm. care about the quarterback situation for the saints he's going to be their number one option give me chris olave and i'm going to go mandre Mondre yeah. looked at the discount version of Alvin Kamara this year. The, the Patriots offense is any better next year. Mm-hmm. He's going to be a top three <laughs> running back. Can it be worse? Uh, I'm going Wilson and Olave personally. That's my duo here. Uh, yep. You know me. I like those wide receivers. Those are the guys I keep. How about you, Andrew? Who are you keeping here in these two? Uh, I don't know if you said the format, but uh, generally half I PPR, half, half PPR. PPR. Swift, Pollard, Wilson, Olave, Stevenson. Some good problems to have, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, given that you're only keeping two, I will take a running back in that situation. Um, and so I'll go with Ramondre. And then I think Garrett Wilson, I, I give the edge over Olave as well. There you have it. All right, everybody. Uh, make sure you go join our Discord again, fantasybros.com slash chat. And don't forget, because just, you know, fantasy season is winding down here. Obviously, we are in the uh, championship game time, but that means the betting season's heating up. Go check out bettingpros.com slash podcast. Subscribe to the Betting Pros Pod wherever you get your pods. It's a great time, way to make money, way to use that fantasy knowledge too and turn it into cash because you're talking about prop betting, all these other things. You're already doing all this work. You've done all this work all year. Go cash in on it. Uh, and of course, make sure you follow Andrew Seifter over on Twitter at Andrew underscore Seifter. And of course, check out all of our work over here at Fantasy Pros. That'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on. For Andrew and Derek, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.